Hey there, this is Sean Falconer, and this is your user's table doesn't belong in your database. During this presentation, I'm going to explain why your user's table or collection in the case of MongoDB doesn't belong in your database and instead belongs within a zero trust data privacy vault. I'll explain what a zero trust data privacy vault is, how it fits into your stack, and then walk you through an example application that gives you all the power and scalability that you're used to with MongoDB while protecting your customer sensitive data within a data privacy vault. The demo will show how you can easily build for privacy with really just a few lines of code. So modern businesses really run on data. Data drives our business decisions, product direction, helps us serve our customers better, increases ROI for a business, and even allows us to create new types of data-driven applications like real-time recommendations that you see on Netflix that we couldn't have built in the past. And we're collecting more and more data all the time and storing that in our backend systems to power all this decision-making. But the really important thing that's essential for all of us to understand is that not all data is created equal. Some data, and I'm talking about sensitive customer data, like people's names, date of births, social security numbers, emails, credit card numbers, healthcare information, and so on, requires better protection than others. We have all this data that we're storing and moving around within our systems, but only a small amount of it is something that we would consider sensitive and could be used to harm an individual or a business if it fell into the wrong hands. The really important thing that we all need to understand is that our customer data is something special. And as such, it needs to be treated that way. Just like I wouldn't take my children's birth certificates, my marriage license, my passport, and stuff that in the junk drawer in my kitchen with my batteries and my flashlights. Instead, I take those documents that are important to me and are incredibly sensitive, and I keep them somewhere special within a safe in my home because I don't want those special documents destroyed or falling into the wrong hands where that person could do harm to me or my family. That same care that we apply to these special physical documents needs to be applied to our customer data. But what ends up happening is we typically end up storing all this customer PII within our application database, intermingled with all our other data. The intermingling and collating of user data with application data results in a number of challenges when it comes to protecting your customer sensitive data. So if we look at a specific example, any kind of modern company of a reasonable size needs just a lot of stuff to just operate. You know, they'll have an HR application for managing existing employee data, an application tracking system for managing hiring pipeline, and a CRM for managing their customer data. And then each of these has their own application database with their own representation of customers or users. Each of these applications can be feeders down into a data lake, and we can have ETL pipelines down into a data warehouse. And we can add more applications over time, and each of these applications are going to be feeders and consumers of this data, creating more and more interdependencies within this graph. And what ends up happening is the PII for our customers ends up fragmented, copied, and replicated throughout this infrastructure. And that makes it really hard to answer basic questions like, what data is stored and where is it stored? Can we be sure that we're meeting certain regulatory requirements? If we need to comply with a data residency law and all our customer data is intermingled with our application data and also copied throughout this application infrastructure, ending up in our logs and our metrics dashboards, then how can we go about disentangling the customer data that should live in Europe from the customer data that should live in the United States? And finally, can we be sure our systems are locked down and that people's data is safe? You know, maybe we can apply point solutions to each node and edge in the graph to lock things down and control access. But we, as we add more and more applications and inputs, that becomes really difficult and an intractable problem. And because we don't really have an approach to solving this, if people continue designing systems the same way we've been doing it for 20 years with putting customer data in our database collections and our tables, we end up with a lot of headlines that are not great for businesses or their customers. Major corporations having data breaches and data leaks over and over again. Because we lack a solution, $56 billion is lost in fraud and identity theft each year. But consumers are starting to demand that businesses do a better job. And consumers want more control over what businesses are doing with their data. Additionally, there are now over 100 different privacy laws internationally. So there's both consumer pressure and governmental or regulatory pressure for businesses to do the right thing and do a better job protecting customer data and get a handle on this problem. So how can they do that? 
So how do you actually solve this problem? And this is really the fundamental question. Well, if you look at some of the leading technology companies in the world, companies like Apple, Google, Netflix, and a few others, these are not companies that are showing up in the news because of a data breach. They're perhaps there for other reasons, but the key insight in the commonality between all these companies is that they realize their customer information that is core to their business needs to be treated as something special. Because their customer data is special, it needs to be isolated, protected, stored, and managed differently than regular application data. So they pioneered this concept of Zero Trust PII Data Privacy Vault, and they move their customer information into those vaults, essentially descoping their existing application infrastructure and existing application databases from having the compliance burden and security risk of managing that data. So what exactly is a Data Privacy Vault? Well, a Data Privacy Vault isolates, secures, stores, and tightly controls access to manage and use sensitive data. So what this means when you start to break this down is that in terms of isolation, the vault needs to live in a segregated network with privileged access. This is storing really important information to your business, important information to your customers, so you need to lock down who can actually access that information. You need built-in privacy-preserving technologies like encryption, tokenization, data masking, and others. This is core infrastructure. It's your customer data. So you need high availability, throughput, support for structured and unstructured data. You need to be able to manage and govern access to the data through a zero trust architecture, locking down specifically what applications or services are able to see and do with data. And then finally, it's great to isolate and protect data, put these privacy and security controls around it, but we are storing all that data so that we can actually use it. So we need things like privacy-preserving analytics built in, database-like access so we can integrate it into our existing systems, secure for cloud functions for passing the sensitive data to third parties. What this starts to look like in terms of an application stack, well, if we take a simple example of an application that doesn't have a data privacy vault, here we have a backend, we'll probably have some security fencing around the backend. But once you're within the perimeter of the fence, all the readers have access to the database. So everyone can see Alice at email.com and our credit score. When we introduce the vault, what we're doing is we're moving the sensitive data, Alice at email.com into the vault. And then within the application database, we're storing a pointer or token as a representation of the original data. The token is a representation, but holds no exploitable value. So we're isolating and protecting Alice's email within the vault and removing the liability of storing and securing that information from our regular application stack. We want to isolate and protect the data, but we also need to govern access to it. So certain parts of our application are going to need PII. Other parts of our application only need partial PII. And then some of our application, or realistically most of our application, never need access to PII at all. So the parts of the application that need PII well, they see alice at email.com. For example, maybe this is part of your application that needs to pass the email over to HubSpot to kickstart a marketing campaign. Other services might only need partial PII. So they only see a masked or partially redacted form of the PII. This could be something like a customer service portal where the customer support agent needs enough of the email to validate the user, but not necessarily see everything. And then the majority of our application infrastructure doesn't need the email at all. So why give them access? that would only increase the potential attack surfaces for a bad actor. So these services can only see a fully redacted version of the email. And if we go back to the example we discussed earlier, where the various interdependencies between these systems creates this very messy flow of PII, where it's fragmented and copied throughout, making it really hard to lock down access to systems and answer fundamental questions like, where and what are we storing? Well, things get much easier when we introduce the data privacy vault. Now the data privacy vault acts as a single source of truth to all the PII data and access to the data privacy vault all goes through a single API. So now when we need to answer questions like where is our customer data stored and what are we storing? It's quite simple. It's stored in the data privacy vault. And what are we storing? Well, we can just look at the schema of the vault to determine that. If we need to comply with things like a data residency law, well, we can segment our customer data into different vaults, one for Europe, one for the United States, one for Brazil, and so on. Finally, since everything is flowing through this single source of truth, we can lock down access based on 
the specific business requirements of the service that needs access. For example, the billing application likely needs access to something like a customer's bank information in order to carry out a billing transaction, but the talent app and the machine learning service certainly don't need that level of access, so they shouldn't have access. We can have fine grained control over what data each service sees, how they see it, and what operations they can execute on it. Now, the easiest way to start to understand how to work with a data privacy vault and build an application around it is to take an example. So we're going to start to dive into a demo application that I created to demonstrate some of the principles of isolation, protection, and data governance that we've been discussing using a data privacy vault in MongoDB for application storage. But before we go into the demo, let's cover a little background on what the application actually does and how it works. I created an application based on a fictitious company called Sky Financial. Sky Financial is a personal finance manager. Clients connect their bank accounts securely through Skyflow and Plaid. Skyflow provides the data privacy vault while Plaid powers the connection to the financial data. Sky Financial breaks down spending habits and assists with budgeting. The target user is young professionals looking to get a handle on their spending and start saving for the future. Sky Financial is a very customer focused company known for their award-winning 24 seven customer support. And this is really the part of the application we'll be focusing on for the demo and for showing the use of the data privacy vault, the data governance rules, the privacy controls, as well as MongoDB. In terms of requirements, there's two parts of the application. There's the Sky Financial customer portal, and then there's behind the scenes, a customer support portal where agents help clients over chat. The system needs secure PII and PCI storage, so we're relying on the vault architecture and APIs for that. We want to govern access to the customer support queues based on the territories that our CSRs or our customer support agents manage. In this case, territory maps to a state in the United States. Finally, we need manager or administrator level governance as well, where they have access to more customer information. In terms of what the application stack looks like, we have the Sky Financial front end and also the support system, which are both built in React. On the back end, there's a back end server, data storage, and secure storage through the data privacy vault. The back end is written in Node, the application storage is in MongoDB, and the data privacy vault is powered by Skyflow. We also have a secrets manager. Just as we want to descope our system from having to secure and manage customer data, we also want to descope our system from managing API keys and database access through a secrets manager. In this case, we're using AWS Secrets Manager. And then finally, we need a way to pass sensitive data securely to a third party external API. In this case, to Plaid. Plaid is responsible for pulling in financial data directly from the banks of the clients using Sky Financial. And we're using the data privacy vault and the Skyflow connections feature to connect to the bank in a secure way. Again, we're completely descoping our application infrastructure from ever having to touch any of the sets of data or having to secure it within the application database. All right, so let's jump over to the actual demo. So I'm first going to log in as a Sky Financial client. So this is the customer portal. And I see my dashboard here, and this information is pulled in through Plaid directly from my bank account. So I see my net worth, I see my monthly spending. I also see the PII that I've given Sky Financial that they store. And since I'm the owner of this information, I see it all in plain text. And then I can click over here to actually start a chat with the customer support agent. But before we get there, let's take a look at the customer support side. On the customer support side, this is the customer support portal where customer support agents interact with customers. And for the purposes of the demo, uh, what I've done is I've created different roles that we can toggle between. Now these roles would typically be tied to the login credentials of the representative, but for the demo, I made it so that we can toggle between these just to make it easier to see what's going on. So here we have a customer support representative for Louisiana. So the territory that this customer support representative has access to is the state of Louisiana. Then there's one for California, and then we have the admin or manager role that can see more information. Right now, the customer support agent for Louisiana has no customers in their queue. If we switch to California, we can see that there's three different people in the queue. And if we click on Nettie, Nettie we can see is asking about her dashboard and the customer support agent can see the customer profile over here on the right. 
and they can see the first name, they see a mass version of the last name, and they see the state, and then everything else is redacted because they don't need access to that information. If we switch to the admin view, the admin view can see all the customers in the queue, and they also see all the PII tied to that customer. Now, of course, you can control how much access the administrator has as well through the policy set up in the vault. Currently, this is set up so that they can see all the PII, but you could, of course, change this depending on the business requirements that you have. So let's go back to the Sky Financial side and start a chat. So we'll send in hi there. And then if we switch over to Louisiana queue here, we now see that Corinne has indeed started a chat and the customer support agent can see their first name, the mass last name in the state of Louisiana, just as we saw for the California support agent. And then I can send the chat back. Hi, how are you? And then Corinne receives that on the other end. So pretty simple setup. Now, there's actually quite a bit going on behind the scenes between the vault and the application database. So we're going to take a look at that next. So if we look at Skyflow Studio here, Skyflow Studio is a web-based UI for creating and managing data privacy vaults within Skyflow. And right now I'm logged in as the vault owner, so I can see all the customers within the Sky Financial vault, but I only see the information presented to me in redacted or partially redacted form, depending on how the information in the columns is set up. So if we take a look at, say, the email column, I see that the information is masked. The reason this information is masked is because the vault understands the different use cases that are tied to the type of data that it stores. So email in the context of PII is not just a basic string, it's actually a data structure that has two distinct components. It has the user part of the email and it also has the domain. And because the vault actually understands the underlying data structure of an email, it can pre-configure certain privacy and security controls. For example, there's a regular expression that validates data going into the column, and then under redaction, which controls how data is partially or completely obscured from view, a masked regular expression is automatically applied to the column so that the email can be partially masked when it makes sense. Under encryption, all data within the vault is encrypted in transit and at rest, as you would expect, but through a technology that was actually developed at Skyflow called polymorphic encryption, operations can actually be performed on fully encrypted data. So I can do something like select star from customers where email equals Sean Faulkner at skyflow.com and run and return that result without ever decrypting any of the data. And then finally, under tokenization, tokens can be used to substitute the sensitive data for non-sensitive tokens. In the case of an email, the default is to use a format preserving deterministic token. So something like Sean Faulkner at skyflow.com gets substituted for a token like BWE09F at FG7D8.com, which I can use and store within my application storage without exposing the actual PII of the user. So let's go take a look at MongoDB. So on the MongoDB side, we have four different collections. The agent collection corresponds to the customer support agents and the territory that they manage. So here the territory is actually a token that maps to state. So this token maps to Louisiana, and this token actually maps to California. And then under customers, the customers collection maps somewhat to the Skyflow vault customers table. Within the collection, we're storing a customer ID that maps to the row within the Skyflow vault, and we're storing a tokenized form of the email in the state. So no PII is stored within the customer's collection in MongoDB. And then we have a conversations collection, which represents a conversation going on between a customer and a customer support agent. And here we have a customer ID and we have a territory token. And then finally, the messages collection is the individual messages going back and forth between a customer and a support agent. And here we have a representation of the conversation ID and the actual text that's being sent back and forth. So no PII or sensitive data is stored at all on the MongoDB side, but, but MongoDB is still able to perform all the normal types of operations that you would perform for an application while being de-scoped from that sensitive data. And then one last thing we'll take a look at, within Skyflow Studio, we control access through the roles and policies that are set up. So if we look at the Louisiana 
role, we have a policy set up that actually controls how customer support agents that have this role can see the information. So here we see, they see the Skyflow ID, the first name and the state in plain text. They only have access to customers in Louisiana. And then they also see the last name masked again, only for customers in Louisiana and then everything else is redacted. So there's both column level and row level restrictions placed on this policy. All right, so let's go back to the slides. See how some of the operations within Sky Financial actually work on the back end. So if we look at starting a chat as a customer, just like we saw in the demo, what ends up happening is first, a chat message and a customer ID is sent to the support back end. And then the support back end is going to request the customer state token from MongoDB in the customer's collection. So we're going to read the customer's collection and get the token for the customer state. And then we're going to return that token. So instead of returning Louisiana, we're returning this UUID. Then we're going to create a new conversation document in the conversations collection, which represents a mapping between the customer ID and the territory. And then we return a conversation ID and then finally 200 okay to the front end. On the customer support side, what we're doing is first the support front end is requesting the customer support agent's territory, which again maps to state. So we're gonna return the UID corresponding to the territory that that customer support agent manages. Then we're going to list customers in the queue. To do that, we're going to request the conversations that exist for the territory get the customer IDs. Then we use the AWS Secrets Manager to pull in a service account key that maps to a role and a policy with the restriction for the Louisiana customer support agent. Then we request customer details from the Skyflow Vault based on that service account key, role, and policy. Then we're gonna pull back application data based on the policies that control access to that information for this customer support agent. So we see the Skyflow ID, the first name, the state, and then the last name is masked. And then finally, we're going to return the masked names to the support front end. In terms of what this looks like in code, we first create a conversation collection object. Then we're going to request conversation IDs mapped to the territory token. Then we're going to initiate our client SDK for Skyflow, and we're passing in a promise called generate bear token which is going to use AWS Secrets Manager to get the service account key and apply that role and policy for subsequent API calls. And then we're going to create a records object with the customer IDs, the customer's table, and our redaction level. And then finally, call the Skyflow client ID with that data object getting the customers in the queue. So we get all of this functionality with just a few lines of code. So this concept of moving your customer data out of your application data and into a data privacy vault really shifts the concept of data privacy really far left to being an architectural decision. Just like when you build a new application and you're thinking about what database am I going to use? How will it be structured? Where am I going to deploy? Do I need a caching system? Do I need Elasticsearch? Do I need a data warehouse, a data lake, and so on? All of these architectural decisions that are made up front when you're designing a system as long as you make the choice to begin by moving your customer data into the data privacy vault from day one, suddenly solving data privacy and related challenges like compliance and security becomes really easy. It's just a handful of lines of code. We can use the APIs and data governance rules to create fine-grained control around how our application, our users, our services actually see and access that information. So I wanna thank you so much for your time. Remember, data privacy doesn't have to be super complicated. If you made the right architectural choices, and that begins with isolating, protecting your customer's data outside of your existing application database within a data privacy vault. You can learn more about Skyflow and data privacy vaults at skyflow.com, and you can connect with me on Twitter at Sean Falconer or over email at seanfalconer at skyflow.com. Thanks again.